So good morning, everyone. Uh, thank you for coming. It's uh, my delight uh, to have some uh, to have today for uh, these uh, bioethics webinars, Professor uh, Kay Toombs. Um, she teaches at Baylor College and uh, she just changed the way in which uh, we see medical humanities today, but not only. I mean, the clinical encounter, the way in which uh, we treat human beings in, uh, in medicine. So uh, without further ado, thank you again, Professor Toombs, for joining us today. Uh, the floor is all yours. All right, well, thank you. I'm very happy to be here. And for those of you who do not know me, I'd like to introduce myself in a personal way because all the work that I've done about the meaning of illness is a reflection of who I am and of my journey living with incurable illness for over half my life. At the age of 29, I was diagnosed with multiple sclerosis and that was at a time when there were no disease modifying drugs for MS. For, so for over half my life, I've lived with disorder and disability and have an intimate knowledge of what it means to live with incurable illness in the context of modern scientific medicine and the prevailing values of North American culture. And my reflections have been further deepened by sharing the last six months of my husband's life after he was diagnosed with terminal cancer. So in my most recent book, which I'll show you there, here called How Then Should We Die? I focus on the debate about what it means to live and die with dignity, but not as an abstract philosophical issue, but as an account of what it is like to face these issues in the reality of firsthand lived experience. So today, I want to consider how prevailing cultural values such as autonomy, independence, the ideal of health that we have, not only shape the experience of illness and disability, but determine how we conceive and respond to the challenges of illness, suffering, and death. And then what I want to do is draw on my lived experience to discuss a radically different countercultural perspective, which provides the context in which it is possible to retain and promote dignity in all circumstances. And that I think really does give us clues as to how we can provide healing in all circumstances. So the first question to ask is, what is dignity? Well, considerations of human dignity figure prominently in discussions of healthcare and in the debate with regard to end of life care. Now, while there may be philosophical debate about the meaning of the term dignity, in everyday life, the notion of dignity is equated with self-worth. To be treated with dignity is to be treated with respect, to be considered worthy of the regard of others. To lose one's dignity is to feel that one's value as a person is irreparably diminished. So the most powerful barrier to retaining dignity is the cultural perspective that we have on autonomy. This perspective de-emphasizes relationship and the stress is on independence, individualism, personal preference. We are expected to stand on our own two feet, do our own thing, look after ourselves. In this cultural climate then, dependence on others is equated with weakness. Connected to the notion of radical individualism is the sense that we should be free to do our own thing without any sense of limits. So serving one another is often negatively equated with self-denial. The assumption being that caregiving is a one-way street, that the caregiver is the only one who gives and the recipient of care is the only one who receives. So not surprisingly, when we have to ask for help, we feel ashamed, 
and feel we are a burden on other people. Now, the concept of burden weighs heavily on the sick and elderly. They sense they expect too much of others. Elderly parents worry that they will be a burden to their children who have their own lives to live. And actually, fear of becoming a burden is cited as a reason to choose medically assisted death, physician assisted suicide or euthanasia. 63% of those who ended their lives in Oregon under the Death with Dignity Act did so are cited as a reason, the fear that they would become a burden to other people. When radical autonomy is considered to be the primary value, autonomy is equated with dignity, so that loss of autonomy is considered by many the ultimate loss of dignity and is a major reason for people requesting to end their lives, not pain, but loss of autonomy. Connected to the notion of autonomy is the focus on the primacy of doing versus being. Worth is equated with productivity, usefulness, uh, success according to cultural values. When we say to our children, you can be whatever you want to be, what we really mean is that you will achieve worth through doing. So consequently, when activities are curtailed, people feel a sense of diminishment and loss of self-worth. These attitudes cause us to devalue the elderly and the natural process of aging. Ezekiel Emanuel, who is a well-known uh, philosopher, uh, wrote an essay in which he says he wants to die at the age of 75. Um, and his reason is because by the age of 75, his usefulness to society and his family will have peaked. He said, people at that age are no longer creative. They experience functional limitations transforms how people remember us. We're no longer vibrant and engaged. And we want to be experienced as independent, not as burdens. So he says at the age of 75, he will refuse all medical care, including preventative care. Well, as somebody over the age of 75, I'm not too impressed by his argument. Recognizing the importance of being is an important step in preserving personal integrity. Being has to do with character. What kind of a person am I? With personal qualities, perseverance, humor, steadfastness, kindness, courage, qualities that do not depend on physical integrity. I remember speaking one time at a conference for people with Parkinson's disease and a lady stood up and she told me, she said, you know, I always thought when I became a grandmother, I would do a lot with my grandchildren, but now I have Parkinson's. But now she said, I realize I can be for my grandchildren. And this was a very freeing realization for her. Cultural attitudes with respect to health also make it hard to accept the limitations of illness. Uh, in our culture, health is equated with the complete absence of disease and freedom from any physical or mental limitation. We spend exorbitant amounts of money in the pursuit of an illusory state of physical wholeness. So consequently, any reduction is considered demeaning. We no longer accept illness, aging and death as unavoidable aspects of being human. Given these views, the sick and disabled do not meet the cultural ideal. Therese Lysort has said to be sick is to be politically incorrect in a most profound way. Weakness, dependence, and imperfection are not part of the story our culture tells about itself. These realities are deeply at odds with contemporary values. Given these attitudes, the most vulnerable in our society are marginalized and isolated. A recent survey showed that 
of disabled people feel lonely on any given day. 38% of dementia patients say they have lost friends since their diagnosis, and more than one in three people over the age of 75 said that their feelings of loneliness are out of control. Sadly, loneliness is a factor causing individuals to choose medically assisted death. In Canada, 18% of people who asked for euthanasia cited loneliness or isolation as the cause of intolerable suffering that made their lives meaningless. Also, accepting illness is difficult in view of the unrealistic expectations about the power of modern medicine. Given the successes of medical care, we have an almost magical faith in medicine and assume that medicine will cure all diseases. I can remember my own sense of shock and helplessness at being told I had a disease for which there was no cure. To find one's disease cannot be cured is to experience a profound sense of loss of control. In a culture that posits absolute autonomy, illness is equated as an unaccessible unacceptable loss of control. Surveys with cancer patients show that loss of control is a major source of suffering. Given the desire for control, this has led us into paradoxical views about the role of medicine. On the one hand, expecting medicine to cure all disease has led us to the view that death is actually a failure of medical science and not a natural part of life. On the other hand, the role of medicine is now seen as the means not just to prevent death, but to cause death, bringing the natural dying process under our control. This represents a profound shift in the conception of the goals of medicine and medical morality. So all discussions about what it means to live with dignity must take into account attitudes towards those with disabilities. Those with disabilities are far from the society's unrealistic ideals of health, beauty, physical fitness, youth, and so forth. In the eyes of the able-bodied, the assumption is that life with a disability is necessarily diminished. When people see me, they see the wheelchair and they assume often that uh, I have no professional life and that my life is necessarily negative. I remember that for many times when I was uh, out, people would tell me, aren't you lucky to have your husband? Now, <laughs> the statement was not made so much with view to my husband's character, but rather the assumption that our relationship was one of dependence, burdensome dependence. I used to say to him, people don't say to you, aren't you lucky to have me? And he said, well, I am. So I said, I know, but people don't say that. Uh, also, when you are in a manual wheelchair, people treat you as dependent and they very often address the person pushing the chair rather than you, would she like to sit here? Um, this always happened when we go through airports, the person who is pushing will wheel me up to the uh, security barrier and the person at the barrier will say, can she walk? My husband had a standard response. He would say no, but she can talk. So when people have the, this attitude towards you, it is difficult for people uh, with disabilities not to feel diminished in person as well as in body. Every time I have had to adopt a new way of getting around, there's the cane and crutches and the walker and the wheelchair, I felt shame. And I can, I'll give you this example from the classroom. I can remember that when, I, when my balance was very bad, I did not want to use my three-wheel scooter to go into the classroom because I thought that the students would think less of me. 
So I would park my wheelchair outside the classroom and then stagger into the classroom and hope that I hit the lectern before I lost my balance. And my husband said to me, oh, that's ridiculous. The only thing the students care about is, uh, do you give hard grades? Will your tests be hard? Will they make a fool of themselves if they ask a question? So I said, okay, you're right. So I took my scooter into the classroom, but what I would have to do is to reverse my scooter into the classroom by the lectern and then turn the seat. At the end of the semester, one of the older students said to me, oh, the students are in awe of you. And I thought, oh, well, you know, must be a very good teacher. <laughs> However, she said, they cannot believe that you can reverse your scooter so fast into the classroom without knocking over the lectern. So there you go. My scooter apparently turned out to be something that was worth celebrating. Um, many commentators note that one of the most profound consequences of the legalization of medically assisted suicide and euthanasia is increasing acceptance in public attitudes and public law that there is such a thing as a life that is not worth living. This narrative is promoted and perpetuated in media coverage. After a positive media blitz on assisted suicide in England, the survey showed that some people considered assisted suicide to be a necessity in the case of non-terminal illness such as disability. This judgment is more often than not made by people who are not themselves disabled. The attitude is mirrored, unfortunately, in the perception of healthcare professionals. In a survey of 153 emergency care providers who are the people who will first see an accident who's had a spinal cord injury, only 18% of them imagined they would be glad to be alive with a severe spinal cord injury, as opposed to 92% of a group of 128 individuals actually living with high level spinal cord injuries who were glad to be alive. Surveys also demonstrate that physicians consider profound debility or cognitive impairment to be fate worse than death. I kind of understand this response because I remember when I was first diagnosed with MS, my thought was that being in a wheelchair would be the end of my life. But having lived in a wheelchair now for over 20 years, I realized that it is not at all what I feared. In fact, the wheelchair has become uh, the thing that allows me to get around, that gives me independence and mobility. So we must be very careful not to make assumptions for which we have no basis in experience. Also, cultural attitudes shape the meaning of disorders such as dementia. Um, we value, this is a culture that Stephen Post has noted is hypercognitive. We value reason and intellect over capacities such as to love, feel, touch, and relate. Clarity of mind and economic productivity determine human value. We also presume that biographical memory, able to remember the past and and uh, visualize the future is what constitutes the whole of memory. And these cultural values shape the attitudes of others towards dementia patients. Stephen Sabat interviewed patients at various stages of Alzheimer's, and they all shared that the perceptions and attitudes of other people shape their experience of losing their worth as a person. Given the stigma that we have about cognitive impairment, the assumption is that dementia patients are no longer fully persons. And yet does autonomy and biographical memory really strip one of one's personhood? My brother had Alzheimer's, but he was still my brother, a father, a grandfather, and a husband. He did not react the same as he did prior to the onset of his disease. We say, well, they're not the person they used to be. 
But one might ask, I suppose, if I'm the person I used to be when I could walk, are you the person you used to be five years ago, 10 years ago? Unfortunately, the judgment that personhood is equated solely with rationality has led philosophers like Peter Singer to argue that it's morally permissible to kill infants and cognitively impaired adults because they are not fully rational, so they are non-persons. What we do know from our experience of caring for people with dementia is that even in the most advanced stages, they respond to music, to love, to prayer, to caregivers who make a point to interact with them, and to loving touch. We tend to think of memory as recall, biographical memory, but there are other kinds of memories. There is bodily memory such as taste, smell, touch, auditory and visual memory, which may still be awakened in states like dementia. While well, having considered how the values and practices of the surrounding culture contribute to the loss of dignity, that accompanies illness and informs the debate about end of life care, I thought it would be interesting for you to share with you my experience of living for the past 20 years in a countercultural, faith based agrarian community to demonstrate in a concrete way how the shift in values transforms the meaning of illness and provides dignity in all circumstances. In particular, I want to note the shift from individualism to relationship, from extrinsic to intrinsic worth, from doing to being, from disability to uniqueness, and focus on the role of the community in expressing solidarity with the sick person rather than marginalizing them. So let me give you a very quick sketch of our community to give some kind of a context. This is an unusual community. It began 49 years ago as a mission church in the slums of New York City with one couple. And as the community gradually developed, they felt to move to an agrarian lifestyle as the context in which to bring up children, raise families and live out our faith. Our spiritual roots, for those of you who are interested, are with the peace-loving Anabaptists, you know, the Amish and the Mennonites. Uh, so as a group of 100 people, they moved to Colorado where they learned to farm, where they learned how to do traditional crafts such as weaving, spinning, pottery, uh, woodworking, and particularly how to develop nurturing relationships, how to care for the elderly, and how to care for the sick. In 1990, the whole community moved to Texas uh, where we have about 1,200 people here from all over the world, uh, from different ethnic, cultural, economic, educational backgrounds. We have a craft village and a school to teach traditional crafts. And we have about 250,000 visitors a year. And in recent years, we've developed communities in Montana, Virginia, Idaho, Mexico, New Zealand, South Africa, and Israel. So that's our community. So when I met this community for the first time, when I was in my 50s, and I met people from so many different backgrounds, um, and yet I could see that there were no barriers between them and they clearly cared for one another, I realized this could only work if they were all committed to some transcendent perspective and ethic which supersedes individual desires and differences. So the foundation stone that undergirds our relationships and patterns of life is an ethic of caring that is grounded in the commandment, greater love has no man than to lay down his life for a friend. So in this context, caring is not considered to be negative self-sacrifice, but it's the foundation of community life. So this foundational ethic turns the cultural perspective on individualism versus relationship upside down. Rather than pursuing the goal of radical autonomy, we're called to live out our lives in relationship, 
relationship with God and with one another. So this shift from self-regarding to focus on the other transforms the cultural meanings of dependence and independence. Serving one another on a daily basis, we recognize our interdependence, our need for one another. So in this context, caregiving is a form of communion with one another and is not a one-way street. We realize that caregiving is a reciprocal relationship, that the caregiver is not the only one who gives and the care receiver is not the only one who receives. This transforms attitudes towards giving and receiving care. I have known many people who at the end of their lives were able to do nothing, but through their attitudes of faith and courage were an incredible blessing and encouragement to the rest of us. Caregivers gain as much as the recipient of care. I remember, for example, our friend Perry, who died at the age of 35 from Lou Gehrig's disease. Um, it's important to recognize that you cannot judge by outward appearance. Perry, in the last stages of ALS, his body was emaciated. He was strapped into a wheelchair. He went into a store with his wife and children. And the person in the store said to his wife, I can't believe you stuck with him. Now, by judging Perry solely on an outward appearance, she missed the fact that he was a loving father who instilled lifelong values in his children, and she missed the strength and beauty of his spirit. He was an encouragement to all of us. In the context of community, it's possible to live out this ethic in concrete ways you know, caring for the sick, elderly parents, neighbor, helping neighbor. We have a lot of people who can help in these situations. For example, when my husband had terminal illness, 15 ladies in the community helped me provide him with round the clock care. I didn't know all these people intimately uh, when we started these relationships, but I obviously developed close relationships with them and bonds of love that will never be broken. Even in the context of community, even the youngest can participate in care. So little children would draw pictures for my husband. Young people would come and sing. People would sit, come every day and sit with him. Uh, we had an elderly lady with cancer who could not sleep at night. So young people in the community volunteered to go by and sing for her through the night. And they have all shared that it has changed their lives for the better. One of the things that is very important to recognize the importance of face-to-face -face relationship. In a day when most of our um, communication is done uh, through technology, we don't have as many face-to-face -face relationships as we used to have. But in this kind of a context, it is very important to focus on face-to-face -face relationships. It is not sufficient to have virtual relationships. You can have 300 friends on Facebook does not provide deep, meaningful relationships. People on social media testify that they have hundreds of friends, but none they can share deeply with and no real life responsibility for one another. One of the things that is important to recognize in terms of thinking about healing and providing dignity is the importance of connectedness. Studies with cancer patients show that the most important fact that related to suffering was a sense of connectedness. Those who felt a sense of connectedness to self, others, ultimate meaning, uh, were felt less suffering, those who experienced most suffering felt a deep sense of disconnection and alienation. One of the things that has been interesting that we found out about uh, the experience with COVID, for young people in this country who were not able to go to school for months at a time, uh, there has been a disastrous effect, not only in terms of their education, 
But in terms of their experiences of depression um, and suicide, the suicide rate for young people has gone up. You know, suicide is the second leading cause of death of young people in this country. Uh, and it turns out that not being able to get together with their friends and their peers by going to school has added to, to their feelings of depression. So it is not the case that um, virtual relationships can take the place of face-to-face -face relationships. One of the most important things that, that we focus on and believe is that all individuals have intrinsic worth regardless of contingent circumstances. So personal worth is independent of material success, physical or mental condition. So the focus on personal worth transforms attitudes towards disability. Rather than thinking of people in terms of their disability, we think of people in terms of their uniqueness. We think of each person in terms of the unique place that they play in the community. For example, we have a child with Down syndrome who sings in the choir, hugs everyone she meets, uh, we have a child with aut autism who has connected with other people, who visits nursing homes. Christopher sees the world differently from uh, people who do not have autism. And his family have shared that it has enabled them, expanded them to see the world in a different kind of way. Uh, Christopher would go and visit people in nursing homes. And he visited one day and there was a lady in there with profound disability who, whose limbs were all contracted. And Christopher ran into her and said, told her, you are so beautiful. And he meant it. And it really meant a lot to her. Christopher sees the world differently. That he was able to move uh, when he was first diagnosed with autism. His parents were told that he would never speak that he would never interact with anybody. Um, but being in the context of a family uh, with siblings, cousins, people in the community who uh, made a point to interact with Christopher. Christopher, if you didn't really know it now, is in his teens and you would, you would hardly know that he was autistic. Even, uh, you know, we also, I also think of Daniel, who is a quadriplegic, who has a vital place in our nursing home ministry. And uh, at Daniel's wedding, a man from the nursing home shared that he was in the nursing home. He was very depressed. He had lost his wife. He had heart disease. And this young man in a wheelchair knocked on the door and asked if he could sing for him. And he didn't really want this person to do it, but he was in a wheelchair, so he said he could. And he said it really changed his life. His interaction with Daniel changed his life. And Daniel pointed out that we all have disabilities. When Daniel goes to a nursing home, they say to him, would you go and speak to somebody who can't walk because we can't share with them because we can walk. So we are disabled in that sense. But if they want Daniel to speak to somebody who lives on the third floor and there is no elevator, then they have to carry Daniel up the stairs. So he's disabled in that sense. But we all have disabilities. Even disorders such as dementia cannot negate personal worth. Um, as I've said before, every person with dementia is a unique person. Mother, brother, grandmother, still a part of our lives and who has a very difficult affliction and needs all the care we can give them. But the thing is, we do not know actually what people with dementia experience. I remember reading the story about a businessman who looked after his wife. He was a very successful businessman, but when his wife got dementia, he decided that he would give up his job and he would look after her got to the point where he had to bathe her feet. Her, she didn't seem to know who he was. And he told somebody, I am becoming more human doing this. And then one day out of the blue, she sat up in bed and she said, thank you, darling, for everything you are doing for me. 
So we really do not know what people who have dementia experience. One thing we do know is that you should never underestimate the power of love. We had a child here who was born with severe muscular dystrophy and was, you know, the question was, will, will he ever speak? Will he ever be able to get around? Will he ever be able to walk? Will he be happy? But in the context of a group of people who cared for him, uh, looked after him, worked with him, he, he got to have a very happy life. He was a very um, engaging child. He was able to um, communicate with everybody. And miraculously, right before he died, which was totally against all that the doctors said it would be possible to happen, one day he, uh, his siblings would tie, you know, have a, have a harness where they could walk around with him on their feet. But one day he pointed to something and he said, I want to go over there. And he walked by himself across the room. And then he said, it makes everybody so happy. I'm going to walk some more. So he did. A few days, it wasn't too long after that, that um, actually Stevie died. But, you know, Stevie was an incredible blessing to us because it helped us to be more caring people and to, to, it really helped his siblings to be more caring people because they got the opportunity to care for him. So uh, one thing I do want to stress is the difference between healing and curing disease. Healing shares the same root as wholeness. So healing relates to preserving a sense of personal integrity and meaning. One can be healed and not cured, as is the case of somebody like myself who has an incurable illness, but who feels a sense of self-worth and personal integrity. And one can be cured and not healed. So one of the things that we know is the vital role of the community in not rejecting, but showing solidarity with the sufferer. Though the meaning of suffering is always personal, there is a sense in which suffering can be shared. And when suffering is shared, pain and distress are easier to bear. I remember when my husband was first diagnosed that I shared with a friend that my greatest fear was that I would abandon him, that I would not be able to stand with him in his suffering. And my friend said, we will stand with you. And that enabled me to be present, to stare death in the face and remain intact. Central to the task of healing and preserving dignity and personal wholeness is the willingness to be present with the sufferer. Bearing witness to another's pain is not an easy task, but in this sacred space, healing can occur. Before my husband's terminal illness, I never understood what it means to find healing, wholeness in the midst of deepest suffering. However, in our experience of suffering, the profound love that we had for one another during our 32 years of marriage was distilled and crystallized. As our boundaries constricted and the reductions of illness got greater and greater, our love got stronger and stronger until in the end there was nothing left but the love we felt for one another, the love we felt from those around us and the love we felt from God. At one point I said to my husband, I'm sorry you have to go through this. And he said, this is a healing experience for me. That this healing experience could take place in the most unlikely of circumstances, pain, physical distress, complete loss of control, facing imminent death, was because healing was the reality that transcended these circumstances because of the supernatural love that encompassed us as it was concretely expressed through the self-sacrificial service 
of other people. Healing is not a solitary endeavor, it requires other people. Given the values of the wider culture in which autonomy is the primary value, to speak of the meaning of suffering is an anathema. Perseverance in the face of suffering is considered to be meaningless. However, as a person of faith, illness and disability take place in the context of a cosmic narrative where the power of love overcomes the power of death. Though suffering cannot be abolished, it can be redeemed. In this context, reductions of illness is the avenue that opens us up to the miracle of relationship, the miracle that brings tears of gratitude and thanksgiving in even the most difficult circumstances and affirms the value of our humanity. So in conclusion, I want to just leave with a few thoughts. If we are serious about enabling people to live with dignity, we have to have the courage to examine carefully our presuppositions and the cultural narrative and framework of meaning that make it difficult for people to retain a sense of personal integrity when facing the challenges of illness, suffering and dying. As we rush to legalize medically assisted dying, we need to recognize it is a very complex ethical issue that is not fully captured in the sound bites of emotional media presentations and Twitter exchanges. I mean, if you, if you really are interested and want to think clearly about, more clearly about this issue, really my, in my book, How Then Shall We Die? I give a lot more information about that. We also need to develop nurturing communities that are count, committed to countercultural value system that rejects individualism and embraces relationship, that affirms the intrinsic value of each individual, regardless of mental or physical capacity, that celebrates being over doing, that recognizes caregiving as an opportunity to serve one another in love and that nurtures healing connections, connectedness to self, other, the surrounding world and ultimate reality. Lastly, what have I learned with over half my life living with MS and living with my husband Stein? What I have learned is that the vulnerability of illness shows us that we are not in control of our lives, that we need one another, that radical independence is not the first and last word of human flourishing, that healing is possible in all circumstances, that it is not dependent on physical integrity, and that healing is not a solitary endeavor, we need one another. And as a person living with disability, I affirm absolutely that it is possible to live whole in spite of the reductions of illness, that illness is an opportunity to decide what is really important in one's life, to live a life that is meaningful and that retains personal integrity and to live a life that is full of joy. And that, my friends, is a celebration. Thank you very much. Thank you so much uh, <clears throat> for this wonderful presentation. It's, uh, you managed to combine uh, personal uh, life and uh, important uh, you know, social and academic topics. Thank you, thank you, thank you. Uh, we have 15 minutes for a question and answers. So if you want, you can write uh, the question in the chat or uh, you can just take the floor and ask your questions. So just uh, let me know. I, I have, can you hear me? Go ahead, yes. Awesome, I have a question. Um, so I know many elderly, at, I wanna speak from like a different perspective and ask a question from that. So I know many elderly parents feel that their parents, their, their children will abandon them at a younger, at, at, as they get older. And culturally speaking, um, 
I'm from India and it, they, so there we believe that as parents get older, we take them into our home, we support them and going to an old age home is such like a bad omen. And like, it's, it's, if you, if you, if they say, okay, if you send them there, then it's the children's fault that you weren't able to care for them well enough that you had to send them or that you were selfish enough to live your own life. And send them there because you don't want them to be a burden now for speaking from this perspective i want to be able to support my parents but i don't want them to feel like they're a burden so how do i go about doing something like that that i mean it is a very difficult uh, thing to persuade people that they will not be a burden because we have internalized these feelings about ourselves but I think, um, I mean, uh, my mother came to live with us and she was always afraid that she would be a burden. But I think, you know, affirming to them that they will not be a burden, affirming to them that you really want to be able to be with them um, will, will help. And you, you, I think you have to kind of prepare the prepare the way all the way along, you know. Right. Uh, and I think, you know, the fact I'm sure that they know from just seeing you and talking to you, they know how much you care for them. And, um, and, and maybe you can just share with them that they, they have a lot to offer you, you know, so, so you know that it's not just this thing of you're taking care of them, and they don't have anything to offer, if you can sort of, you know, um, convey to them that they really are so much part of your life and they have so much to give you and you're so appreciative of that. Um, and just, you know, maybe, maybe you can also talk to them about why it is that they feel that they will be a burden. You might talk to them about the unrealistic values that you see in the culture, which makes people believe that they're going to be a burden, but that those values, I mean, the, it, it is a very unrealistic ideal that we can all look after ourselves. I mean, how many of us would be able to feed ourselves if we couldn't go to the grocery store? Right. Uh, we depend upon all those other people for everything. So it's a very unrealistic ideal. And so um, maybe you can also share with them that, that um, that's, you know, I read a very, uh, a, a very amusing article written by a philosopher who says, uh, the article was, I want to be a burden to my children. And um, of course, what he was talking about was he wanted them to feel that he was not a burden, but he said, after all, they've been a burden to me he said, I had to sit through endless piano recitals that I didn't want to, and I had to dress them and feed them. And so, you know, you can, you can tell them that too. Will do. Thank you. Thank you for the input. You're welcome. Yes, go ahead, Lola. Okay. Thank you very much for the, can you hear me? Can you hear me? I do. I don't know if uh... I can hear. You. Yes. Okay. Yes. Okay. Okay. Thank. Thank you very much for the presentation. I really love it, and it's quite timely, because I'm in a period in my life when um where I'm thinking about my parents who are aging, vis-a-vis -vis my other siblings who are moving abroad. Of course, I, I also have similar ambition related to career, you know, but then it, it's also a burden on my mind that do I really want to move far away from them, given that they are aging, like maybe I should give a bit of a background. Sometimes in June this year, my grandfather passed on. And um, before he passed on, I, I had the opportunity of going to see him every other week because he was ill from December 21, 2021 up till the time he passed on in June. So from that December till May, I was going every fortnight to see him. 
And when he eventually passed on in June, I had this consolation in my mind that I was able to spend some quality time with him before he passed on. Now, you talked about um, caring, being more personal than virtual, like face-to-face -face relationship is much more important than virtual. Now, I have aging parents, and um, all my siblings are traveling abroad, and I don't know, they, they probably aren't thinking about that, but it's some burden on my mind that I would love to stay close to them and care for them because they lived practically all their lives for, the, for us. But then I'm also thinking, how do I do that such that it doesn't hamper my own career path, my own ambition? I'm into academics and um, I, I, I want to, I wish to be the best I could be. And I also have this ambition a bit, or this vision about myself of being well-traveled as an academic. So I, if you could just help me shed some light on it, how do I give as much of myself to my aging parents without it having impact on who I want to be and what I'm doing and what I would love to be as well? Thank you. Well, I don't know that I'm going to be able to give you very good advice, but, um, and I see that it is a very difficult conflict. And that is why um, it is so, so very different if you live in a context of, of community like we have, you know. So uh, where those conflicts are not as vivid as they are for you. So I really can't, tell you what it is you should do in this situation. Um, you know, as a believer, I would pray about it and feel like I would know which way to go. But I see that it is a very difficult conflict. It's not one that's easily resolved. So I don't really know how to give you concrete advice as to, oh, you should, you shouldn't follow this path, you should stay here. I think that as your life continues, you, these, these decisions may become clearer to you in terms of, you know, what your job is going, where your job is going to take you, where your parents are going to be. And so I think, I mean, I think that's the only thing you can see at the time. It's very difficult to know. I mean, maybe if you went to a different place, your parents could go there too. I don't know. So um, I don't really know how to tell you how to, how to solve that problem. It is a problem, but it's one that you are aware of. And as your life progresses, solutions may become available to you that you don't see right now because you don't know exactly what the future is going to hold. You understand what I mean here? Yes, I do. Okay. Thank so, you. But I think it, you know, I think it is um, very wonderful that, that you actually see this as a conflict because many people would not. And it shows that you really care for your parents and you want to do the best for them. And I think that you may find that solutions that you don't see right now may become available to you and you'll be able to make your decision more, more clearly then. Because, you know, we really can't make decisions when we don't know what the situation's going to be. You understand what I mean? Because you... Yes, I do. I don't know exactly what your life is going to be like, but I feel like a solution will come up for you. And I'm glad you are. Thank you. Thank you so much. <clears throat> Other questions uh, from the audience?
these have been very good questions. Oh yeah, I I like how personal uh, the tone is uh, because uh, these are the real conflicts. Uh, this is exactly what happens. Yeah, the I, I really like the emphasis you put on uh, dependence, and uh, yeah, it's uh, it's curious, especially in the US. Uh, to see how dependency is considered uh, a problem. I mean, I, in Italy, we tend to live, you know, in these big houses where it's normal to depend on one another and still have- I, I noticed, I have noticed that, you know, in, in other cultures, right. I had, had a young man come and talk to me who was a student, um, who his family is Mexican, they're from Mexico. In mm -hmm. that culture, it's still more of a village community. Mm -hmm. You know, families live together. And in that kind of a culture, it's not, it's not the, the conflict that, that your student just brought up because it, it's yeah. sort of considered, you know, part of living the way that that's the way they live. Um, yeah. Uh, sorry, I, I just wanted to add to that a little bit. So I'm very, um, <coughs> excuse me, sorry. Um, I'm very religiously oriented. I'm, uh, I'm Hindu from birth. And from that, there's a lot of cultural aspects that I adopt. Um, there's one that my father always tells about that is no longer in practice. But there's one where you divide your life into four quarters, 25 50, 75, 100. And then when you're going from the first quarter, you're till 25, you are to focus on education. Second 25, you are to focus on home life. Third quarter, you're supposed to focus on um, like your children. And the fourth quarter, you're supposed to focus on like sort of uh, in a way detaching yourself from all your possessions so it's not so hard to move on and may I just say that like I feel like our perspective on life changes a lot of the things on how we view and take action on them and so this perspective even though it's still it's not in practice today but like that perspective on life is so sort of liberating because then you don't have to be like as you said in the beginning of your your, your speech right that that death seems like a failure on the health system if it's, it's perceived as it being a failure which is so incorrect like even though we all know that we will all one day die it's unavoidable right and yet we're, we think it's some mistake that someone has made and I I do like I like the culture perspective or the religious perspective that this outlook has on it because then it says no it's something we all go through and let's go through it together let's accept it just wanted to add that on. Well, um, you know, one of the one of the strange things about our culture is that um, the complete notion that we should not suffer ever at all. This is something that I think is peculiar to this culture. Because if you live in other cultures, in some other cultures, in not the circumstances that, that we live in, not the physical circumstances, suffering is, is just a regular part of life. You know that suffering is a part of life and that dying is a part of life. And so, um, as you point out, under that perspective is that it is very liberating to recognize that we have to, that there are reductions in our life that are going to come and that they are no normal part of living. And so um, the reductions of illness, the reductions of aging are accepted as a normal part of life. And so that means that, uh, I think it also means that we recognize that elderly people are be going to become frail and that if we're a younger person who, who is not that frail, that you know, part of who we are is to help the people who are frail, knowing that at one point, some point in our lives, if we live long enough, we are going to be the frail people. But the, the other thing is that um, 
if we hang on to the notion that there should be no reductions in life and that as a matter of fact, we're never gonna die, that when these reductions come, it makes it much more difficult to accept the fact that our lives are changing. It makes it much more difficult to accept the fact that now I'm an older person and I'm not able to do, you know, as a natural part of life, I'm not able to do what I was able to do when I was 20. Um, and it makes it much more difficult. And I, I don't have the quote with me, unfortunately, but um, I remember reading a quote from Michael Main, who he, he, at one point he was the Dean of Westminster Abbey, but he was dying of, of cancer. But he, he talks about if at the end of my life, he said, if I can unclasp my clench, clenched fins, fist and let go of those things that were given to me and that were never mine, then yeah, I can accept what's happening to me with gratitude for the life I've lived and with hope for what is going to happen after I die. It's not being able to, uh, to open the clenched fist and let go of those things that were given to us and that were not ours in the first place. You know, every breath is a gift. So, um, so that, that kind of a, a recognition of the reality of life is very important. Well, I think our time is up, but this has been a very um, engaging discussion. I've enjoyed being with you all. Oh, me too. We enjoyed your uh, your presentation uh, very much. And yeah, uh, I mean, uh, another little emphasis on uh, what you said about uh, healing uh, and being cured. I mean, you can heal in the midst of uh, the worst suffering. And uh, yeah, being cured is, is another thing. Healing is uh, something more profound and spiritual that can happen uh, in any situation. Thank you. Thank you so much, uh, Kate, for sharing uh, this wisdom. Uh, with us today we You're welcome. appreciate it yeah all right and we'll be in touch absolutely all thank right. you again